connected to, and I can actually do live demo, and I will do live demos here. Uh, and then the other part is, I've got everything up on GitHub over here, so you can pull down, there's a, that's my GitHub, and then there's um, something in there called OpenShift Performance, you can clone that. You'll get the slides, you'll get um, a couple of labs, some helper scripts, and blah, 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 right? Um, on the home page in the readme is how to set up that VM that you've got. So I'm going to pretend that uh, you've used VirtualBox before, which I hadn't until yesterday. Uh, these are VirtualBox images. You can also unpack them and use them with ClemU if you, uh, the command's on the page there to convert it. So uh, first person to get their VM up and running gets a, gets a, gets a <laughs> piece of swag, OK? But you have to prove it's up and running. If it was libvirt, I'd have it done yesterday. Same here. So anyway, I, I just don't have a lot of confidence in that. But I, I actually, more, way more important than, frankly, way more important than hands-on demo, I just wanted to convey to you guys, I guess, um, uh, how, how we do our work. Maybe you can reuse some of those concepts in your job. Who here works on, who here tests stuff for a living? Only a couple of testers. I mean, developers are supposed to test too, right, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, not as many QE as I expected, but that's cool. So I just maybe I can then tell you what in the forms engineering group we, you know, how we approach our job and how that trickles down into the products and how we work with engineering to make our products better. So I'll go through some of that. Um, I'll give you some of the performance results that we have most recently with OpenShift. Our, our current effort is to get OpenShift v3, um, sorry, get OpenShift.com upgraded to version three of OpenShift. Who here has used OpenShift before? Version two or version three? Three, a couple people use three. Okay. Um, so it's vastly different. It's basically a different product, quite frankly. I mean, it's got the same goal in that you launch applications based on your source code, um, but there's almost no other parallels in terms of how to operate it, how to install it, what requirements there are, how it can scale. It's extremely different. I've been working with them for over four years now to test V2 and now V3, so. Uh, okay. So there's no little clicker, right? Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's the, that's the, I wanna just clone that. I don't know how the wireless is gonna work for you, but. Um, and some instructions on how to set up the VM, but again, all those are on GitHub, so I hope you can reach GitHub right now and get those instructions. Uh, yeah, sort of, sort of covered most of this already. Um, I'll show you some of the tunings that we've got. I'm actually, our team's responsible for the, the Tundi, pro, Tundi product as well, it's in RHEL, um, which is um, workload specific kernel and there's some user space tuning in there uh, to optimize for certain workloads. We've got profiles for pretty much every product that Red Hat sells uh, from the platform view and most of them from the cloud view at this point. And Atomic and OpenShift are no exception to that. So as I mentioned, we're converting OpenShift.com. We have to make sure that it scales vertically and horizontally. Um, we're working closely with Samsung and, and Google on those efforts because we all have the same sort of end goals in mind. And um, we're pretty much at the forefront of, of R&D into Kubernetes scale and performance at this point, including Docker. I think, quite frankly, I think we, we're further ahead than both of those companies. But, uh, I digress. Okay, so uh, what we're, as a group, um, we get, well, this is not even the slide I want. This is the one. We get our inputs from a bunch of different kind of stakeholders, we'll call them. Engineering, Bugzilla, customers, our own research, the marketing people are always reaching out and helping and asking us to create data that helps the field sell the product. Uh, so we write white papers and blog articles and things like that around performance to help us differentiate from the free bits. That all ends up in a tracking system like uh, like Trello or whatever else you use to manage your work. And then at the bottom is our, our workflow, our pipeline. All of revolves around automation, so everything ultimately gets automated through Jenkins and you know whatever, supporting scripts that we need uh, in Beaker and EC2. A <coughs> uh, couple of the key boxes that I'm gonna talk about today, pretty much 
only two boxes on here I'm going to talk about today, the data collector and, and the cluster loader. Um, as a group, we have a need to profile Linux and user space uh, throughout all of our testing. And so we've, as a team, built uh, a data collection harness. And uh, it's plug-in extendable. It's called pbench. Um, and we've written, Elko over here has written plugins for OpenShift that allow us to gather cluster state as well as uh, Golang profiling data which has helped us already quite a bit. Okay, so the, the fun thing about working on the emerging products is that there, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, I guess. Um, and having experience from previous generations of software, I've seen pretty much all this stuff already. There's, they're not really handing out patents for any of the new container-based stuff because it's pretty much all been done already. If not, if not 20, 30 years ago. Um, from, from a productivity standpoint, we're able to jump into the new stuff pretty easily because the fundamentals don't change. There's four food groups, CPU, memory, disk, and network. And those need to be in a healthy balance. There's bottleneck analysis. It doesn't matter what the software is, the techniques are the same. <coughs> So, um, I mentioned we're trying to get thousands of these nodes, did I mention that? We're trying to get thousands of these nodes running, and <laughs> part of the first thing we, we ran into was that, uh, so OpenShift uses Ansible as its installer, um, and uh, yeah, so we had to tune, actually tune Ansible in order to not have the install take six hours. So for a thousand nodes, a thousand really cheap nodes on Amazon cost 200 bucks US, an hour. So to have a thousand node cluster that takes three hours, to, six hours to install costs a thousand US dollars just to install the product. We can't do that, of course. So we had to optimize the installer and uh, actually I think on a subsequent screen here, yeah, I've got, I've got a recipe and uh, I think we submitted it to the documentation people. So. Going through that process is going to help the product because now we help the customers um, install the product faster. And it's actually a lot faster. It went down from six to uh, two hours. It's two hours for a thousand machine clusters is pretty good. Um, so anyway, part of the process in getting there was uh, we had to learn how to build AMIs. Who here has used EC2 before? Okay, a small percent. Uh, neither do we, quite frankly. Our group had worked on bare metal and VMs pretty much exclusively. And since, uh, since OpenShift is hosted on Amazon, we had to get up to speed on EC2. And uh, a lot of the things we learned were, I guess, what you'd consider basics, but they end up being kind of arcane knowledge and not very well documented. So anyway, we had to build our own AMI that was preceded with the configuration and the, and the tuning and the best practices. The only way to be able to have this thousand machine cluster usable in a very short period of time was to do a lot of work up front. And one part of that was seeding the AMI with Docker images, which take forever to pull, um, even on a fast link like EC2, a couple of seconds per machine is not tolerable. So the fastest way ends up being to have everything already in the image. And so that's what we did. And everyone here uses, uh, sorry, everyone in my team uses the same AMI for our testing, which is, you know, RHEL 7.2, the latest Docker, well, the latest OpenShift, whatever we're testing. Um, yeah, so there's the Ansible. Uh, that should be in the documentation by now. Okay, I mentioned the TuneDeep product. It rolls these settings into, uh, so the upstream defaults are kind of for our laptops, quite frankly, and if, in a lot of cases, and uh, the RHEL, as a data center operating system, we decided to change some of those defaults to perform better. And uh, a lot of the hardware has changed out underneath Linux. So in order to actually gain back the performance we used to have, we had to make some of these changes as well. So basically, we couldn't ship RHEL 7 regressing 20 or 30% versus RHEL 6. We just couldn't do that, even though it has nothing to do with the software. It's all about the newer chips. So anyway, a lot of that is undoing what Intel had done over the last couple of years um, in terms of uh, 
creating processors with deeper C states and frequencies. So these, these CPUs basically go to sleep <laughs> when you're not using them. And that's cool for power savings, but it actually hampers performance quite a bit. So what we did was we, we sort of found a happy medium in between the, the low end and the high end uh, for, for RHEL. So it will save power, it won't burn, you know, it doesn't run full out unless you actually put load on it. But anyway, so that's some of the stuff in the top left box that we did for RHEL 7. Um, also to help tasks stay on the CPU longer, we've increased the scheduler quantum and increased the block read ahead. Um, those are things that don't regress workloads, they only help. So. Uh, we also reduce the swappiness value, although I very rarely see swap uh, unless there's like an app application bug at this point. I very rarely see it used. So anyway, um, it has a 2D has a concept of inheritance. So you've got profiles that build on their parents. Uh, throughput performance is the default pro profile in RHEL 7, and for virtual guests, we have a we do a couple extra things. Um, if you install KVM, you automatically get that profile. If you install RHEL 7, you automatically get that. So for a virtual guest, you have this plus that. For OpenShift, you've got this. Well, let's say OpenShift on, inside of VM, you've got this plus this plus this. So when you install OpenShift, this is the tuning that you've got by default. Um, and in the future, we've got a couple other things that we're thinking about for scalability. Uh, actually, the fast open is for performance, too. So, um, all these tunables here don't come into play that we added until you get to like, what was it? A couple hundred containers. Our original guesses were that people wanted to run many hundreds, but from anyone I've ever talked to, they've always said, you know, if we get to 50, we'll be happy. So we're pushing it way beyond that for OpenShift.com. Um, it'll be in the hundreds for sure, and it's all the products are showing their. Uh, lack of scaling capacity, I guess I'd say, when you get to that point. I got a question. Yeah. Do you have like any sort of automation for this fine tuning of these parameters? Like, I don't know. This like is automatic. So uh -huh. what it does is it looks, Tuned as a service is started by default. It looks at um, Etsy system release CPE, which is a machine parsable file that has like rel, its version, and its variant. Variant being like workstation, server, <laughs> atomic. And so if it's installed on atomic, it'll see that and it'll apply the whole thing. So it is automated. Uh -huh. um, and you can unwind all of these and you can create your own profiles. This isn't a Tune D presentation, but I, I just want to let you know that our group contributed these because they help in all of our tests. And so they should help customers too. Uh, yeah. So. I mentioned there's two boxes I'm gonna go over today. One is the, the data collector, and then the other one is the, uh, the cluster loader. And I mentioned pbench earlier. So it's on GitHub there. Um, and I'll show you a demo of it real quickly. So what it'll do is it'll go out and run all of the tools like SAR, MPSTAT, IOSTAT, um, perf, and it'll collect them, normalize the data, and produce graphs. The reason we do this is because we want to put very tight calipers around the test itself. We want to be able to control the interval of different tools at different rates, and this puts a nice, easy to use um, wrapper around all of the system tools. It's kind of funny because it supposedly has a stable, uh, stable versions of packages, but we tried to use SAR from RHEL, and actually there's enough churn in between versions that we actually have to carry our own SAR. So when you when you do when you install pbench, you you might see sysstat getting pulled in from uh, a different repository that we maintain and compile on our own. Why is that? Do the different versions of SARS change the performance values? No, they don't change the performance. They just change the the output is like not standard in any way, and the arguments change, and uh, the data file format is not backwards compatible. So if we need to machine parse it, we either need to keep copies of every SAR binary that Red Hat's ever shipped, or use our own and then have a little bit more control. So that's what we decided to do. It's kind of like, we didn't want to have to put it that way. And we tried for a long time not to, kept breaking. <coughs> At this point, we're not really about, um, I take that back. We file bugs wherever we can. 
but we're not going to fix everything we find. Um, we sort of have to move on and get, get on with our jobs, which is to get performance data, not to stabilize SAR. Um, quite frankly, what we're going to do is move all of this to PCP eventually anyway. PCP's binary format is backwards compatible for the last 25 years, so at least we won't have that problem. We'll have, we'll have something else broken, probably. Anyway, so this tool creates um, that I'll show you. And uh, we've got benchmarks as well built into it. So you can run, um, well, we, we use uperf for network testing instead of netperf, but also FIO for storage testing. So if you just type pbench underscore FIO, it will do a full sweep of your storage, um, you know, small packets to large packets, throughput to latency. Uh, it'll run several samples. It'll calculate standard deviation. It will... Um, if it's outside of a standard deviation window, we'll throw out those results and continue to run samples. So it does its best to get reliable data out. And uh, so we ship a bunch of benchmarks, like NetPerf is in there. Um, uh, yeah, you can take a look at those if you want. So that's one tool. The second tool, so when we started with containers like two years ago-ish, uh, there was no tools. There was zero visibility into any of this. So we had to build a couple of things. Oh, also at the same time, someone, uh, Colin invented like the atomic OS trade, mean, meaning we couldn't actually add software to RHEL anymore. Um, so that really is a problem for people trying to debug. Everything is new all at the same time. Atomic, we can't install anything. Containers, no one knows what the hell they are. Um, RHEL 7 just came out, like we had just barely shipped it. And now we have to do debugging um, in an environment that we're not comfortable with. So what we did was build a tools container. Well, we had a container that was we were using internally, and it, it became so useful and popular that uh, we, we ship it as a product now. So if you do uh, docker pull uh, rel dash tools, I think that works. I've got the CentOS example on the bottom here. Anyway, you'll get, you'll get an image pulled down that's got all the debugging stuff that we would normally use. It's got, um, you know, there's a list of them here. So on an Atomic system, if you actually need to troubleshoot what's going on on RHEL Atomic or Fedora or CentOS Atomic, you'll need a container, you'll need to build your own that looks a lot like this, or you can use the one that we ship. So Docker pull CentOS slash tools or Fedora tools, those are all up on GitHub. Uh, Fedora, no, Docker Hub. So I'll show you that one in a second, and it's actually like the use case for uh, super privileged containers. Has anyone heard that term before? A couple people. Super privileged container is a container without the container. Um, it's a container that disables every namespace and every bit of security except the mount namespace. And we've even been able to disable the mount, na mount namespace. So all you're left with then is the PID namespace, um, and even you can turn that off. So when you launch this container, it does not get its own network stack. It uses the host network stack. It uses the host process table. It actually bind mounts the hosts slash partition into the container to allow you to copy files from inside the container to the host. And that's actually how Sauce Report works on Atomic. So if you're on an Atomic system and you type sauce, um, it will spin up one of these debug containers uh, and copy the tarball of the sauce report out to the host. Because the container, when you stop the container, the container goes away. So in order to get debug from our customers, uh, we use <coughs> this container. So it has, it's actually grown arms and legs and far beyond what we had the original intentions for. So it's been used by, it has, it's all used by the support guys quite a bit. It does, uh, sorry. Like Got isolation for a bit, right? The, the isolation. There's for like as little isolation as possible. Yeah, it's basically just a packaging format. Quite honestly, you know, there's I, I can run one. It is a fat, little fat container, though, because it's got a lot of stuff. And part of the reason Atomic is we were able to shrink the install size of Atomic 
is because we pulled all of the useful stuff, at least from my perspective, out of the OS. And we pushed it into a container. So you don't need this container for the OS to function, but if anything ever goes wrong, you're going to need it for TCP dump or whatever else. Right? So I think it's like, I think it might even be up to a gig um, after you uncompress it. So this guy helps, <coughs> helps us with our day-to-day -day, uh, and helps the field as well. <clears throat> I could have sworn I had this container pulled already. Maybe a different machine. Okay. Oh, I updated it. That's why. Okay. So the container image is on this system now. And I'll start a container. Let me, let me do this first. Um, can you guys see the bottom of the screen? I'll move it up. So I just type docker run and then the container name, right? And I just get a shell. Uh, there's no host directory. And pid one is bash. Just, I just want you to keep that in mind. Um, I think this patch is actually in upstream Docker, but for a while it wasn't. So what we've got is metadata associated with the container image itself that Docker doesn't use, but Red Hat has a tool called Atomic that actually reads those labels and, and runs Docker in a certain way. And so for the tools container, it runs, I had mentioned it tries to disable as much security as possible. So it, it runs you know, in privileged mode, um, in the host, na host, it drops the network namespace, it drops the PID namespace, it does the bind mount on slash host. So basically this is the command you have to run to get a super privileged container. And we didn't want our customers to have to, I mean, no one would ever get that right. So what we did was um, add l this label support. I must have done this on another machine. Sorry. Okay. So now I'm in this container, right? I, I, I typed atomic run this time instead of docker run. It spits out the label, just for reference purposes, how it executed the container. And then, if you notice here, my prompt is different. My prompt is the host IP. That's because it doesn't use the UTS namespacing kernel. So, now, if I type PS. Sorry, are you inside container now? Yeah. But I'm inside the super privileged container, which is mostly uh -huh. not a container. And so what I just... Well, what's the reason or difference that this uh, prompt is uh, different? The, so because if you, use, if, you, if you use, if you, if you use, if you don't use um, double dash net equals host, so if you, if you don't, if you join a new network namespace, you get a new host name. That's what it is. But now, since I didn't create a new network namespace, I am now in the host's network stack. Uh -huh. I thought Which the command line was same for Docker and for the Atomic, so it wasn't. It, it wasn't. I typed uh -huh. Docker run manually. I typed Docker run manually. You saw it was just like those three things, Docker run uh, CentOS tools. But in this case, it ran that huge mess of a command. I have the VM running. OK. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, so now I typed PS inside this container. Look, I can see all the processes that are on the host. Okay, I can also see the host storage is mounted in slash host inside my container. Okay, so at this point you can use yum to install whatever you want, um, uh, or I could use you know whatever TCP dump it is. So. That's probably a bad idea. So basically, it becomes a regular user process in the operating system. Pretty much. It still runs under Docker, though. Mm -hmm. 
So the child, it is a child of Docker still in terms of the process tree. So it is not technically its own process. So what is now in, the in that container? It was still, still bash. Still bash. Mm -hmm. Because that's what I typed. You actually can do something like uh, uh, So I don't have to give it bash. I can just give it a command to run. And it'll run the sauce report inside the container. But we also patched sauce so that it knows to look in slash host slash sys for all of that debug information that sauce usually collects. It basically chiroots itself in slash host. It's running inside the container, but it has to look outside the container for certain virtual file system data that it wants to collect and pack up on behalf of the customer it sent to us. So this is, this is actually digging deep back into my memory because we did this a couple of years ago, but I figured it was useful to show you the super privileged container, the tools container at the same time. So it's doing, uh, almost done. So do you have the slash host file system now? Yeah, I'll show you. I forget where we put it on the host though, now that I think about it. Bar temp, I think. I should have done something a little bit less time consuming. So this is what the customer does when they submit a support ticket. They'll run sauce report, attach it to the case. That way the engineers can unpack it. And deep. Does anyone work in support? You know this already, sauce? Have you used sauce on Atomic? Yeah, but this is, that's where it all came from. Um, okay, so it packed up the uh, tarball. And if you notice here, now I'm back on the host. You can tell because I customized the bash prompt. It doesn't look like a real bash prompt. It looks like a Jeremy. Uh, I think it was more temp. Where the hell did we put it? to run it with one additional flag, so it copied it into the container. But basically, I forgot, so the atomic run has a double dash SPC command, which, which is what uh, would have moved that file onto the host file system. Okay, so that's the super privileged container. Um, okay, so now let's get into some of the, uh, this slide is out of order. This is the sort of Kubernetes specific stuff around performance, fairness, resource management um, that I wanted to talk to you guys about. So Kubernetes has this thing called a quota. And the quota can currently, so there's, a, there's several different objects in Kubernetes. One of them is a namespace. It's called the namespace upstream. OpenShift calls it a project. It's the same thing. Um, these quota files are per project. We're going to increase the granularity to make it per pod as well, but it's not yet. And inside the quota can be things like how much memory they can use, uh, how many pods they can run, how many replication controllers, blah, blah, blah. Right? Does that make sense? And uh, millicores is a way of equalizing different CPU generations to kind of a single, boiling different CPU generations down to a single number. That was invented by the Google guys who have that problem uh, across their infrastructure. So they call it millicores. It's, it's a Google thing, but Kubernetes uses it. So basically this is 20%, uh, and it's not like, so like 20 microseconds on one CPU would perform differently than 20 microseconds of CPU time on another CPU generation. And in order to equalize that, and make it sort of fair across their infrastructure because they're selling CPU time, they invented this, this formula that attempts to kind of even the playing field amongst different chip gener uh, generations. Anyway, so that's, what, that's how you express um, so if you're offering service to your customers, 
you might offer them something like that. And we're going to actually for OpenShift.com instead of one gig, it's going to be two gig, but something like this is going to go to OpenShift.com. Maybe we won't let them have 10 pods. I don't know what the rules are going to eventually be, but every namespace will have a JSON or a quota like that applied to it. So that's how you handle resource management. If you notice, there's no network or block I.O. in there yet. It's coming. Not yet. Dan Winship um, gave a talk today about uh, networking and what they're going to do is use TC to rate limit um, virtual V devices, virtual interfaces that are inside. He, if you weren't in Dan's talk, basically told you that there's a, a VETH device on the inside of the <coughs> container and a VETH device on the host OS. They're connected as a tunnel. And what we're going to do is, is uh, insert TC traffic classifier rules at, at the certain point that allows us to throttle traffic in and out of the pods. Um, no, I think it's in and out of the containers, actually, not out of the pods. So the difference between a container and a pod is that a pod is a single uh, network namespace. Could have multiple pods, multiple containers running inside it. They all share the same subnet. They could talk to each other without firewalling. Um, so pods is a logical grouping of containers. Pods are actually the smallest schedulable unit in Kubernetes. Uh, so when you, cr I'll, I'll do it in a second. When you create a pod, when you create one, if you want to create one container, you're actually creating a pod that only asks for a quantity of one. Pods can have all kinds of other attributes that make no sense in the Docker world. Like, what node do you want to get scheduled onto? Or this quota thing. This actually toggles C-group stuff, as you can imagine. Uh, the CPU and memory, anyway. And uh, the pods and services are actually logical distinctions inside the etcd, which is what Kubernetes uses as a database for storing this sort of thing. So that's that. Um, and then I figured I would go through, did anyone else manage to get the virtual machine up? The virtual machine on the USB? I ran out of space. Yeah, I guess. Two, two out of like 30. The broken base. Yeah. On the VM is a copy of OpenShift Origin from like three or four nights ago that um, it's everything statically linked, so you can just type like OpenShift master start, and it starts a master OpenShift start node, and it starts a node, they automatically talk to each other, and then you have your own environment inside that VM. Alternatively, you can download Vagrant VMs from OpenShift.org uh, if you have Vagrant. So, getting a demo environment has proven to be the hardest thing, so I really apologize. <coughs> Okay, so for CPU and memory, um, it kind of depends on where you're running. So we're assuming most people are either going to run on a public cloud or burnt of some kind. Whenever I do a survey, if I go see customers, whenever I do a survey, like 90% of them use, are using virtualization of some kind. There's very little bare metal out there amongst the enterprise customers. Bare metal might be like a couple of machines that they still run SAP on in the back corner. Or um, Oracle, because of a licensing thing that they can't get out from under. There's like very little excuse to use bare metal, by and large. There's there's still a couple of cases where you still have, where you have to have it. Stock exchanges will never use any kind of bird, however they're interested in containers. Um, my point being that when you're in a VM, you have very little control over the CPU and memory optimization. You can lock yourself to a virtual CPU. You can like task set if you're familiar with that, or NUMA control yourself to a particular virtual core. That doesn't mean anything about what the host kernel is going to do. So in Amazon's case, it's Zen or whoever they're using, like uh, Google uses KVM. The host kernel can schedule, or schedule you wherever you want. So this sort of tuning makes no sense inside, a, uh, inside the public cloud. And frankly, we want to get away from the hand tuning anyway and kind of improve the kernel scheduler and automation. So what we did for RHEL 7 was we built an automatic uh, NUMA balancing feature into the, uh, into the kernel. And what that'll do is keep threads in their memory on the same NUMA node. Who here knows what NUMA is? OK, I'm not going to go through that. Basically, in the, in the RHEL 7 kernel, uh, threads in memory are more likely, not guaranteed, but more likely to be on the same node. Uh, so that's the type of thing we're trying to add to the kernel to help it, um, not help so people don't have to hand tune as much. OK, uh, for storage optimization, 
this is kind of the thing that's burned Red Hat the worst in the world of containers and Docker is that when Docker came out, they shipped on something called AUFS, which is a union file system, um, but it's not upstream. And we weren't able to do that. So we had to invent something on our own. Uh, and so we have this uh, LVM-based, well, thin provisioned LVM-based driver for Docker in RHEL. Um, and what's really bit us is the default one uses a loopback mounted sparse file and the performance is shit. So on that VM is a loopback mounted Docker installation. So it's not you, it's the way the storage comes by default on Fedora, RHEL, CentOS. So um, Vivek Goyle from uh, the Docker team used to be on the storage, I forget, he used to work on something, on, something else on the kernel. He came over to work on Docker storage specifically and he wrote this helper utility called Docker Storage Setup. So if you have an atomic VM, we've done this for you where we've got a separate partition just for Docker. And instead of using a loopback mounted sparse file, it uses a raw block device and it's a lot faster. Um, so for production workloads, or even for your workstation, if you don't want it to be sh slow as shit, if you have an extra device, that's the, that's the trick. You have to have an extra device, which is why we can't ship it by default, because not every computer is guaranteed to have two block devices. For servers, it's a lot easier. But uh, the laptop use case, actually, is what Docker, is what our default installation is, is optimized for the developer use case right now. So if you do yum install Docker, service start Docker, whatever, it will do this loopback thing. Like, so it will work, it just won't work, you know, production level. So are you using ephemeral storage on, on EC2? Um, the local one, which yeah, is for, so for, for, yeah, for, on EC2, we're using, well, no, it's actually an EBS device. Yeah, so no ephemeral storage. We have ephemeral storage for the OS, but we don't, yeah, we don't use it for, for Docker. No, we have a second device. That's another part of our AMI. Every AMI that, like for the performance team's AMI, has a second disk wired into it, and that's just for Docker. So that's what we're using there. Uh, so we have really great documentation, believe it or not, on, on how to switch from loop to, to this uh, thin, thin LVM thing. And so I definitely recommend you look at that. In terms of tuning, it's the same as like bare metal storage tuning. You've got to worry about the I.O. scheduler. Um, you've got to worry about write back. You've got to worry about um, the, the trick with these containers is that the kernel really has no clue of what a container is. <laughs> and it's because they were bolted on. So there are many critical places in the kernel that really need to be taught about namespaces that aren't. And one of them is all these sys controls. So the memory management sys controls, and networking sys some of the networking sys controls are not namespace aware. And that becomes a problem. So those are things we're trying to improve, but it's really difficult to retrofit the Linux kernel to do really what um, we're asking containers to do at this point. So anyway. Uh, yeah, this is the Docker storage setup screen. And then, and so we, what we thought was going to happen was we were going to move to a union file system which doesn't have this requirement for a second device. And it's a lot faster. It's got a lot of upsides. The main one is memory efficiency. It actually allows you to share page cache between containers, which makes the density and memory usage of containers and startup time um, a lot more efficient. The problem with overlay is that it's not POSIX compliant and it breaks things randomly. Um, and the really funny part is that the CoreOS guys decided to make it their default. And I don't think it's anywhere near ready. It just went upstream like six months ago. So for a file system, no, I mean, it was out of tree for a long time, and I think SUSE was actually shipping it for, for a while. Um, and we've, we've got guys that work on it now, but we're supporting it with 7.2, but it's not, the, it's not our default. So for 7.2, in the case of Atomic or OpenShift, you can use Overlay with the understanding of there's like 15 caveats in our uh, in the tech notes for RHEL 7.2 around OverlayFS. One of them is, uh, actually it's kind of funny because YUM wouldn't even work in an Overlay-backed container because YUM was, 
I actually forget the, the exact bug, but um, it had to do with the RPM database being like stale. It, it, it had to do between like the copy ups, the way the union file system worked. I don't have the details. Yum was broken. So Pavel Ad, Adbabi, Adbabi, I forget how to pronounce his last name. He wrote this little plugin for Yum that actually triggers a copy up on the lower layer inside a container. So when you use the RHEL 7 base container and you use Yum, you'll notice there's a new plugin there called OPL. So our base containers have this overlay plugin. It doesn't matter if you're using overlay or not, it still gets loaded. So uh, that's to work around a non POSIX compliance issue in, in overlay. Okay, so networking one. Um, if you weren't at Dan's talk, I'll go through the basics. Kubernetes has no network setup thing by default. Um, who here has set up Kubernetes upstream? One guy. Kubernetes, have you set it up and installed it? If you set it up and install it, you can't do multi-host anything because there's no network setup. They recommend you use Flannel which is fine, but Flannel doesn't, Flannel is a Coralized product. Flannel's fine, except it doesn't provide any multi-tenancy guarantees. So using Flannel, you can actually, like containers from different customers can talk to each other. And of course, that's not gonna fly. So we had to invent something on our own. And what we did was come up with, uh, uh, it's still, so Flannel uses VXLAN, and VXLAN is a way to um, encapsulate TCP packets and, and allow them to uh, basically allow overlapping networks as well. I'm not doing a good job of explaining it. But the point is that we actually have our own carry now, which we're trying to get away from, um, because Flannel doesn't support Open vSwitch yet. And the way we've implemented multi-tenancy is with open flow rules in Open vSwitch. Uh, and what's called virtual network identifiers. So every tenant inside OpenShift gets their own vNID, and the packets are tagged such that, and the op there's open flow rules that allow segregation of containers. <laughs> So, um, from a performance standpoint, uh, and Dan mentioned VXLAN offload NICs, um, I think it's, I think it's, uh, I don't know if we'll ever see them widely available, but VXLAN traffic, I mentioned it takes a packet, it wraps it in a UDP outer packet. Uh, there's a couple of problems with that. One, it, it takes additional CPU time on the sender side, and then the receiver's got to unpack it. Um, and then transmit it to user space. And all of those extra CPU cycles add up, particularly when you're using fast links. So right now, even with high-end CPUs, we can only do about five gigabit in over a VXLAN tunnel. And- So uh, you need on the same host? No. From one to other country? Different, con different hosts. Mm -hmm. Across a 10 gig link? Like different hardware host? Yeah. And do you run it on Amazon? Or yeah, we ran it on an Amazon. How's the list setup? What's that? Uh, also, this setup with uh, 10 gigabits. Uh, yeah, with, 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 we did it with SRIOV on Amazon. Because they're 10 gigabits. You don't know what's the way uh, below and Yeah, no, you, was, performance there, analysis in the, in the public cloud is a mess. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult. We have, that's one of the reasons that we use pBench, because it'll run five tests. One of them will be wildly different, and it gets thrown out and run again. But in reality, that wildly different one was a valid metric. It was so far out of bounds because someone else came in and took your CPU time, whatever. It manifests itself in all kinds of weird ways. There's ways around it. Like Amazon is almost a pay for, pay to play game at this point. Or public cloud is almost a pay, pay to play. They, they entice you in, like a drug dealer, with really cheap compute. But when you really start running production loads on it, you realize the cheap stuff is not gonna work. So what we've had to do is find ways to cheat not necessarily cheat, but to, to be as efficient as possible. And part of that has involved software changes inside Kubernetes. This one was, this one sucked. So we had like a hundred node, um, a hundred node Kubernetes cluster on EC2. And it turns out that like every 10 <laughs> seconds, it was do, every node was checking in with the master and telling you, Here's everything I'm doing right now, okay, which we want to happen. We need the nodes to talk to the master, but we have to stagger it, we have to compress. So there was a lot of changes that went in here. And the before is this, 
blue thing. And this is actually, it, it, in order to do a 100 node cluster with Kubernetes like six months ago, you had to have 16 CPUs. And now you need one. So there were a lot of efficiency changes that went through, went, went into that. One of them was this. Um, and to give you a sense of how much we've improved, this is, uh, so this is CPU at max, 95%, blah, blah, blah. All I'm trying to convey is like the relative difference. So this is OpenShift a year ago. This is our new release. And this is upstream Kubernetes. Before we do our new release, this is, sorry, this is internal. Um, but we're gonna be here before we release our next version. And this is all, not all, huge amount of Red Hat work to make this. So that's CPU efficiency. So we used to take just like, this is the number of cores. So four cores in the idle state. Four CPUs just burning. And they were actually, it was actually something called C Advisor, which is um, a way that Google, it's a piece of software that Google wrote to, uh, to have per container metrics. And it was just crushing the CPU by having too frequently a polling interval in Sisyphus. So one of the things we learned with Elko's Golang profiling was that C Advisor was to blame for all of this. So we've done some tuning in C Advisor, and eventually, it's actually statically compiled inside Kubernetes right now. So there's only so much we can do, but it's going to get factored out um, into a container at some point, so we can at least put it on a different node. So that's some of the stuff that uh, that we've been working on, and in Kubernetes. So I guess I don't really need to cover too much more of this. Um, jumble frames are still important for storage traffic. One of the things we're doing with Kubernetes is creating a way to have different traffic on different network interfaces. So we'll have storage traffic over one interface, we'll have VXLAN traffic over another one, and then we'll have a managing network, just like a real cluster. Uh, quite frankly, it hasn't been that way. The software is new, so we're still building all these features. At the end of the slide are a couple of blogs that we wrote about um, kernel bypass into containers using solar flare open onload and Intel DPDK. Um, I think at the time it was sort of let's try everything we possibly can in a container. And this was one of those things where we're, we're taking a piece of hardware, dedicating it to the container, and bypassing the kernel entirely from a network standpoint for performance reasons. Okay, I'm gonna skip this one. Oh, actually, yeah, we can't do this in a public cloud. So this is kind of the, this is kind of the problem, is that we're com public cloud is like the, the lowest common denominator. If they don't support it, we have a hard time prioritizing it on the OpenShift side, because folks aren't running it on bare metal. There's gonna be a few that do, but not everybody. And so, if it's not available on a public cloud, we have a tough time developing it. And VXLAN, since it requires specific hardware, and it's like a Red Hat or a, you know this type of environment specific thing, Amazon has no incentive to do it, neither does Google. So what we actually need is a way to use existing offloads and make the VXLAN offload um, NIC agnostic. So it'll work on every NIC. And there's, there's just a shit ton of work because it's a known problem amongst every customer, every company that uses VXLAN. This is a known thing and there's a lot of work going on around it. There's no solution immediately. The performance difference is pretty dramatic though. 20 gigs a second. And then if you enable the offload, you get you know, line rate, which is, well not line rate, but like 36 gigs a second, so 40 gig NIC. Just with the hardware offloads. Sorry, how did you activate the offload? I thought the standard kernel doesn't support uh, offloading uh, to, to Nestle kernel. So this is, you're talking about TCP offload engines maybe, and that's not mm -hmm. supported, correct? This is different. This is like TSO or GRO. Dif there's offloads available in the network cards right now. Um, it's just another one of those. It's enabled by default. It's supported in RHEL 7. Um, and uh, yeah, it's enabled by default. <laughs> so if you have these NICs, it will just magically work. You don't have to do anything. 
from a latency standpoint, there's really no difference. Okay. Uh, then we did a, a shitload of pods. We got these pods, like this is like a matrix test where you got 96 pods all talking to each other at the same time. What do we see? And the reason we wanted to do this was to find out what the optimal number of pods to run is. So you can see here, and actually this, this goes back to my point earlier about none of this stuff like being new, it's kind of the same concept over and over again. Uh, if you can see the colors there, and you can see the top performing line, guess how many cores were up this system? Uh, the green line being the most performant. There were 24 cores on the system, and that's the most performant one, which means everything beyond the green, this is overcommitted. When you overcommit, you pay a price for it in terms of performance. But sometimes, in this case, it didn't drop off that dramatically. So I might actually tell people, yeah, you can overcommit safely a little bit, make more money on the same gear, um, or not buy new servers, or spin up. That's quite a high number of megabits. Yeah, well, the, okay, so this is, um, no, 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 it's actually additive, so it's, yeah, it is. It, it's, that, it's that many megabits across however many pods are running. So it's actually a, a multi, you actually have to divide that number by the number of pods running to get the single flow rate. It's not that bad. You have four over commit and you only have like a two percent. Okay, so then we pushed it further. We went to 192 and the machines crashed. Seriously. So that's kind of something to worry about too. Um, have you ever pushed a machine to the point where it says like dazed and confused? There actually is an error message that will, yeah. So that's all what happened. So if you go ahead and rerun this thing, um, by the way, we're trying to open source all of our tests right now. Uh, they're not open immediately, but we will eventually open them out and you'll be able to de duplicate this stuff. And uh, if you want to crash your machine, it's pretty easy. Then we did the latency one. I mean, I don't know how many slides you, I mean, how many graphs you want to look at, but so, so back to the network segregation thing, what we did, so while we were running those network tests, um, there was so much data flooding over those links that the cluster heartbeat, which is what those check-in, remember that blue line? Mm -hmm. That's the cluster, the things are checking in with each other, they're saying, hey, I'm okay, I'm still here, I'm still here, I'm still here. Well, if the master doesn't hear from the nodes for a while, it pulls them out. And when it pulls them out, all those pods go away. So it pulls it out of the cluster, which is what it's supposed to do. So what we need is a way to prioritize the cluster traffic over the rest of the traffic. The traditional ways of doing that with QoS on the switch, we can do it with QoS and Linux, or we could dedicate links. And it turns out that it's actually easier to dedicate links than anything else, especially when you have an API to add a network card like you do on any public cloud. So we wanted five NICs in this machine, done. Um, they're virtual NICs, but they allow for segregation, and they allow us to have this cluster heartbeat network separate from the VXLAN where we can't control what the customers are going to do on it. They could, a Docker pull. Docker pull sent to us tools. It's gonna to pull one gigabit over the network. If, a, if, if enough customers do that at the same time, the link is totally chewed up. And at that point, if you're unlucky, those heartbeats could be interrupted. So there's a way to extend it. And actually that's what we ended up doing for now. Um, I think it's 40 seconds now, so if it doesn't hear from a node for 40 seconds, it'll, I think it'll, I think it'll take it out. 40 seconds and has to fail three times. There's some weird algorithm. So we triple it, basically. And that got us around the problem because the tests were short enough to fit in that window. It's actually not a fix, it's a workaround. So, so the cluster means a bunch of uh, Kubernetes uh, managed nodes? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, no Red Hat cluster suite or something? Correct. Not Red Hat cluster suite. Uh, we do have a place for Red Hat cluster suite in this stack, though. I'll show, I'm going to show you a network diagram in the end. Sorry, a question about the, the congestion. The, but the problem uh, the purpose was about the congestion on the network or about um, CPU processing power or something in the Docker? Um, no, it was about the, well, so the network utilization meant the CPUs were pegged. There was the CPU, the, the systems were pushed to the breaking point, and it's at the breaking point. real time scale or something like that was not used in the case? We didn't use real time. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, Maybe it's not even possible. 
We can't do Docker containers at real time yet. And there's another blog entry. If you Google Docker real time, you'll see it. Um, right now, they have no interest in supporting it. And uh, because of that, if you, if you sat through Dan Walsh's talk earlier about that thing with systemd and Docker, we're kind of stuck behind that for real time processes and containers. We need we need system, we need to we need native system D support in order to do real time and containers. Until we have that, we're kind of screwed. So um, is there another question? Okay. Anyway, there weren't that many people that actually used EC2 though, or a public cloud, right? Hands up again if you've used a public cloud for any reason. Did you guys notice anything about them? Was it convenient? Was it fast? Was it cheap? Expensive. It scales well. Yeah. Yeah. We noticed that the performance varies significantly, um, so you have to hedge. We also noticed that you can buy dedicated stuff, which means you don't have this variability. So do you use dedicated hosts on Amazon? No. no. Um, the fun part about dedicated hosts is that they're actually not metal. They're actually dedicated hypervisors. So you still get VMs, but they're dedicated to you. So you get rid of the noisy neighbor problem where someone else comes in and, and you, you know, your, your tasks get unscheduled. But uh, you are able to schedule just one VM per the whole machine. Yeah, you could do that. Something like uh, you still pay, you still like so when people say dedicated, I guess the important distinction is that it's not very metal. That's all. Uh, have, you, have you tried it on Rackbit right very much? Yeah, but I haven't. And also, um, what's the other one? The one that IBM bought. What's that other cloud that IBM Software? bought? Yeah, they also have a, uh, a bare metal variant too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's places where um, we could start purchasing time from them, but we're not going to learn anything we don't already know because we already have our own bare metal. We have our own gear. Yeah, but I mean the OCP stuff is pretty interesting, and uh, we did a lot of tests with uh, with CoreOS mm -hmm. and just to container like uh, consolidation ratios and stuff like that. It was it was amazing. Yeah, and probably mainly because of the disk throughput. So there's overheads for vert in a lot of cases, and you just don't, you know, you just don't pay it with bare metal. It's got its own problems though, and we can't live migrate containers right now, so it's kind of. Someone demoed it. The guy from Parallels. I think he. I don't know if it's tomorrow or not. Not today. It was it today. He's got a way to live migrate containers. I assume it's memory. I assume it's CPU tasks and not not hot, not live migrating storage. But anyway. So there's some other gotchas if anyone's used the EDS. Um, they've got this thing called a quota. So if you just flood, or if you just do a lot of I.O., eventually they're going to put the brakes on and you're going to be down at like 40 kilobits a second. So we ran into this Elko, this is, these are his graphs, where um, he was running our pbench FIO tool and it does, I don't know, I think it ends up doing like 30 terabytes terabytes of I.O. In, in all of its sweeps additively. Um, around 18 terabytes, we started noticing this problem. And the OpenShift people also brought it to us separately where Docker just died. And Docker died because it wasn't hardened to handle that. It was expecting I.O. to come back soon. And I.O. never came back because they hit their quota. So there's a couple ways around it. One is to not run pbench FIO, <laughs> or one is to, to buy faster storage from them. So this is another pay to play, where you can buy provisioned IOPS, where it'll, be, it'll, it'll have a slower top end, but you won't have this. You won't have that like drop off. Um, yeah. Incidentally, this is Amazon's cloud watch. They have their own thing that uh, lets you monitor your stuff. So this is actually Q depth. Um, yeah. Okay. So this maybe this will make it more clear. If we run pbench FIO once, we're good. Three thousand IOPS, which is what EBS is currently rated at. If we run it again, we're down at like hundred IOPS. That's because they put the brakes on. Um, and the system is at one hundred percent IO weight. So if you look at IO stats, one hundred percent. <laughs> Disks just aren't returning. They're not. They're not telling the kernel that okay, I've, I've, I've taken control of these these uh, bytes and you know, whatever. 
Um, and then the third one here, this is with a provision volume, which costs a lot more than EVS, but it's guaranteed throughput. So we did a couple of things. Um, we improved Docker to handle the random storage pause. And um, we're also actually going to buy more expensive disks. I believe the advantage of Docker is to use a big machine on this T2 micro, which is standard. No, the, the T2 micros are just for and test. Just like, for scale. Like, uh, buy something like CC8, uh, Super Arch, and uh, split I'll show you. Many you when, you see, when you see the, oh, I'll just go right to it. OK, they did the same thing on CPUs. Um, storage, yeah, storage performance. So you can see here that EVS is significantly slower than SSD. This is one of those things where it's like, if you, if you run on EC2 and you do enough work on EC2 like we've been doing, then you, and then you go back to bare metal, you, you realize how slow EC2 really is. It's not just EC2, I'm using them as an example. It's public cloud in general. You've got this shared environment that scales horizontally really well and there's no CapEx involved. It's all OpEx types expensive, so the, the finance guys are generally happier. But when your OpEx goes up significantly because you can't, like this doesn't suffice for you and you have to get closer to that, so this costs you, you have to pay. And every cloud does the same game. So I've got a couple more slides, but I wanted to show you what um, what an open a, full, a highly available OpenShift environment looks like. We've got a, so you had mentioned Red Hat Cluster Suite. This guy uses uh, PaceMaker to manage the VIPs on the masters, and uh, we've got the Google. I'm sorry, the Amazon load balancers in front of those. Registries talk to S3. We've got routers with load balancers in front of them. These are software load balancers. I mean, this is all on uh, public cloud. And then we've got two etcd clusters. So one thing we added to Kubernetes in the last couple of days was um, we have the ability to shard the data. If you're familiar with database scaling, it often comes with sharding. Etcd had no Kubernetes had no concept of sharding. We had we had support for that. So now we can put the high volume keys on a dedicated cluster and the lower volume keys on another cluster so we can get those heavy hitters away. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll pay for some high end gear here for those uh, high traffic keys. So we are hitting a lot of scalability problems because of that. Because um, actually what it is is the events. Kubernetes logs a shitload of events. And if you've got a lot of containers, those events all multiply. And all of those get shoved into etcd. Um, so we did a couple of things. One, we did the sharding, but two, we also we also toned down the amount of events um, that, that Kubernetes is going to log to help scale out. Uh, and then on the number of nodes, like this would be up like up to a couple thousand, and they're all talking to EBS. And so you had mentioned the type of machine. This is what we're currently thinking for a very large environment, like a thousand node machine, a thousand node cluster. Um, those machines aren't cheap, you know. These masters and etcd they need to be really powerful. And etcd uses a shitload of memory, so you need high end gear, uh, which makes it not cheap. And um, oh yeah, and then the network segregation over here. So we're going to put the management stuff separately, the xclan, and so this is the the pod communication, the stuff that um, Dan Winship was talking about, and. Uh, and then we're also going to put in most likely a dedicated link between the master and etcd. etcd. So the nodes talk to the traffic flow is nodes to the masters, and then the masters go ahead and talk to etcd. And we can't buy machines large enough on Amazon to allow us to co-locate etcd and the masters um, because they only sell, I believe they only sell 64 gig machines. At this I think they might be offering 128 gigs soon, and at that point, we'll probably have outgrown that. So basically, we have to keep them separate. Um, so that's how we're going to scale out EC, uh, OpenShift to 1,000 nodes. So, yeah, a couple more minutes. Um, oh, so in terms of scaling out of the box limits, Currently, 40 pods a node-ish, something like that. 
and uh, 255 nodes is the out of the box default limits. You can tweak all those. I mentioned device mapper earlier. Um, so that's kind of, I call it a limit, but really it's, you make a choice between stability and speed. Uh, so you mentioned with overlay file system, it's possible to uh, share page list. Yeah. So, but this, this is not the case for the regular system. Correct. Uh, the so question is the nodes are virtualized. Is it better to run less VMs with more parts of it, or is it better to run multiple VMs? That's not going to matter. It won't matter because from a Kubernetes perspective, the number of pods is all that matters. But the number of objects, let's say, they could be pods or replication controllers or services, routes. Um, those are the things that the master has to worry about. So at a certain point, yeah, you know, but it's not, 40 is, is conservative. Remember I showed you that CPU graph where it keeps getting more and more efficient? 40 was because it used to be terribly inefficient. 40 is not something we have to worry about anymore, but we haven't yet shipped all the fixes. And once we ship them, that, that 40 probably, I mean, I'm not in charge of that thing, but it, it could potentially go up. So, um, yeah. So we've basically took, taken every part of this environment, deconstructed it, found the limits for each individual part, found best practices for tuning each individual part. And so this screen talks about etcd. Um, we know it needs extremely fast storage. We know that uh, it needs a ton of memory because it actually keeps somewhere between two and three copies of the database in memory at any given time. Um, we know that swap is going to crush it. And uh, we know that we, the master and the etcd are constantly talking to each other. That's another thing we're doing is that the efficiency, we're trying to make it more efficient, that the communication path between the master and etcd. Right now it's way too chatty. And it scales depending on how many nodes you have, there's more traffic. So we want it to be more efficient. And uh, so we're reducing a lot of the chatter between the master and etcd by finding out if we can um, add some jitter to the, the callbacks. If every machine's got a synced clock, then every you know, minute the machines are gonna check in. We want that to be staggered slightly. So we're gonna add like a one, one or two second fuzz on both sides of that so that it doesn't come this additional more thundering herd problem where the master all of a sudden goes from 5% CPU to 100 after it works through its backlog of all that stuff that just got thrown at it, it goes back down to 5% of CPU. We want it to be a little bit more steady. So part of that is uh, reducing the amount of chatter. So, okay. I mentioned um, the GitHub repo. In there is a subdirectory called SVT, and in there is a subdirectory called content. Inside the content folder, if you haven't cloned it now, you can go ahead. Um, inside that content folder are a couple of examples of pod manifests, replication controller manifests, quota manifests. I hope you like writing JSON. And you can use those to work through the labs that are on the GitHub repo also. The inside of one of those manifests, you've got really basic ones. But some of the additional capabilities we can do is we can, we can make it a privileged container. We can increase some of the uh, capabilities that the kernel has, these are kernel capabilities. So the container would then have sysadmin. Um, we can run custom scripts and we can, we can mount volumes in a, in a pod manifest. So there's just a, an ever-growing list of capabilities that these manifests can have. You can also say, land it only on this node. Node five. Or you can label your nodes and say this node has a very special SAN attached to it. I only want my pods to run on that server because that SAN is super fast. So these particular pods, let's say they're my SQL pods, they need super fast storage, only ever land on the nodes that are physically wired to that SAN. You can do that in the in the pod manifests as well. So the concept I just mentioned was, is called uh, node selector. And uh, so you can land a pod on certain nodes and, and either you give it a host name or you give it a label. And the labels could be anything. Um, in OpenShift's parlance, we've got regions, by default anyway. Um, and so you've got the primary region. You can, they're, they're arbitrary. It's a key value, it could be anything you want. 
So you could say, I want machines that are in row five, rack two. Only those machines get this pod. I don't know. However you want to carve it up, that's how you do it. Um, we've got scheduler fairness, pod fist resources. So remember the quota JSON I showed you? It says you can use um, uh, 10 pods or a gig of memory. If the machine doesn't have a gig of memory to uh, a gig of memory free, then it would not schedule on that pod, on that node. Same thing going along with the rest of these ports. Those are, those are ephemeral ports that might be available. Um, disk, this is extremely complicated, but the point is that you can have persistent volumes attached to pods and we, sh we, we, ha we support a mode called um, multiple readers, but we don't support multiple writers because we don't support cluster file systems just yet. Um, we support things like Gluster and Ceph, but not multiple read-write mounts. So that's, that enforces that. Eventually, we'll say no, no, we'll eventually be able to remove that when we figure it all out. And uh, oh yeah, yeah, so you got the, the uh, actually this is a label region uh, for services. So you can schedule a service that lands on a particular pod. And a service is a virtual IP that has a HA proxy associated with it that is, the, is what the external world talks to. So the external world will, actually they talk to a route. So a DNS name translates to a route IP. That route talks to a service, and the service is actually an HA proxy that talks to however many pods are on the back end of it. And so we've got some tunables there. We can put the service on a particular region. Let's say it's the West data center. Or, and then we can do some weighting about where, um, where those pods might be scheduled. So, this again is a list as of three or four weeks ago, and I'm sure they've added them since. They've added stuff since. This is available inside Etsy Origin Master Schedule JSON. So on your VMs, if you cat that file, you'll see. This is actually JSON. I kind of cleaned it up to make it more readable. As you mentioned, a system, so it's uh, running on Gluster for some. Yeah, Kubernetes supports persistent volumes of iSCSI, NFS. Fiber, cluster, and stuff. So, and I think so. You you, you don't use uh, multiple mounts for this cluster mounting just from one point. Like it's it's not possible for, to write uh, from for, two pods to the same cluster volume. Or not it? yet. We can do it in cluster. Cluster can do it, but Cube can't do it. Eventually, we'll fix that. Okay. So profiling of GoLang. Who here is familiar with Perf? The tool Perf. Yeah, so, so <sighs> Golang has, was written by Google and has their own profiling utilities called pprof. And uh, so perf doesn't work quite well. It doesn't work very well. And it certainly doesn't have all the features that the native Golang profiler has. Um, so you can enable, part of the things we, this is part of the stuff that pbench automates for you. Um, and it's part of our job to look at these profiles and be able to identify what the problem is. So if you, if you used Kubernetes from you know, six or eight months ago and you scaled it out and you had these pprof data files, you'd see, um, you'd see things like TLS handshakes at the top of the profile, or you'd see things like C-Advisor. And those are all problems that we've resolved. So there's, there's new, new problems at this point, or at least there are orders of magnitude smaller. And one of the example issues that I showed you earlier with the blue spikes, if you want to go read the gory details of that, that's the link to the issue where we fix it. Okay. Yeah, so that's it, I guess. There's CPU efficiency. We're doing a lot better. Um, we're going to be well under one core to manage uh, 120 pods which is a significant improvement. It used to take us three or four cores to do the same work. And uh, yeah, and the memory efficiency has shrunk by a factor of like two and a half. So a huge amount of improvements from an efficiency standpoint. I think that's, that's all I have in terms of slides. Um, 
So if you've got the <coughs> SVT repo pulled up, get out of this container, you'll see this file called, uh, so OpenShift Performance SVT, you see this cluster loader thing? Manchu wrote that in the green shirt, and a lot of our guys are contributing it to it at this point. What it is, is it takes one of these YAML files, which looks like that, okay? And it deploys an OpenShift environment that looks like that. So you can say, I want two users, or in our case, thousands of users, but in this, the demo one, like two users, three services, two replication controllers. I haven't even told, I haven't even gone into that yet, but each one has five replicas, 10 pods, 40% of them are Hello OpenShift, and the other 60% are Python. Some other stuff we did at the bottom was we had to insert some delays because there's races in the kernel that we had to fix. So we had to work around them by inserting some delays um, in between container operations. And we also pause every once in a while to gather some state information using pbench. So to run this guy, I created a little bit of a smaller one. And I think this only takes a couple of seconds to run. So to run it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run this, and then I'm gonna quickly switch to another window because I wanna, I wanna show you actually what Kubernetes sees on the other side. So let me prep that. Okay. Um, this is a little bit smaller, just I don't really have the right resolution here, but okay, so this is, um, OC get nodes, uh, get pods. So I'm, I'm asking, it, I'm asking the, the master server how many pods are running, and um, OY tells me what server, what actual uh, sorry node they're running on, and minus W sets up a watch in etcd. So uh, it doesn't actually loop; it's an event-driven thing instead of pulling. So it's much more fair on the master in terms of resources. I guess how we figure that out. So if I run this guy, it's going to create a new project, create three services, create a user, create five pods. And what it's doing right now is it's waiting, because I told it to wait, uh, until all five pods are running. We've now got five pods running. After a couple seconds, we'll start seeing some more stuff stream out here. There we go. So it scheduled another what do they tell it? 15, 20 pods. They all say pending. Now they're saying running. Tells you how long it's been running for and what server it got scheduled on. This is actually just a three machine cluster and there's only two nodes. So now, if I go back to the other screen, yeah, it's actually still going. So that's what this software will do. And now what you can do is you can say, what do my developers need or what do I expect to host? And you can model um, your test environment and figure out how much budget you need, how far, how many, how many EC2 instances you might need, how many physical servers you might need, what kind of storage you might need, all because of uh, this workload generator. Actually, sorry, the cluster loader. So, I think it's, yeah, only a couple more. Now the point is that you express what you want in YAML and it goes ahead and does it for you. We've chosen to use the Hello OpenShift pod, which is uh, for the sake of it being fast for the demo. But it could be any pod, the rel pod, the CentOS pod, the, any pod you want. And um, any mix of them as well. So we could have, like I told you, we did half, sorry, half um, Hello OpenShift and half Python. And what you're seeing now towards the bottom here is a replication controller. It's just called test RC0 and test RC1. You see they're all running. So I think I've got everything running now. Let's see. Yep, so the script exited. That means the environment is in the state that we want it to be in. And now we go ahead and run whatever tests we want, whether it's network, storage, whatever. We've got an environment that's got pods. We're gonna do JMeter tests against it, <laughs> whatever. And uh, the other thing I wanted to show you is that
So it'll tell you, if you do describe and then the resource name, like in this case, test RC0, you can see a lot more detail about this replication controller. A replication controller is um, a horizontally scalable resource in Kubernetes that says, I want however many pods. We say, I want one pod, but if, it, if you create a pod by itself, it's stuck at the number one. If you create a replication controller with one pod in it, you can then scale it horizontally however far you want. In fact, this is how um, Kubernetes is doing uh, horizontal scaling, auto scaling in Kubernetes. So it'll say, I've got too much load on this one pod, start up another pod in the replication controller group. So that's how that works. And um, so everything has a describe. You can do like, yeah, you can just, you can describe every resource. So OC get, I typed OC get nodes. Tells you the, the host name, um, but more importantly, this this region over here. These are arbitrary tags. I could name them rack five, and only land pods on the node that's in rack five, something like that. So if I wanted to create a pod, sorry, if I go to the content directory, in here are all these examples. Um, the pod default looks like this. So it uses a hello OpenShift container, it opens one port, and it runs a Go binary that just sits there. A replication controller, however, says I want to run this image and do this, this the same thing as the original pod thing did, but it also has this extra field called replicas, and that's however many pods are running. So if I have, let's see, you saw I created a replication controller that had five pods in it, right? So I just reduced the number of pods in that replication controller from five to one. And you can see I've got one pod running and one desired. But let's say I want to schedule, let's say I want, let's say it's Valentine's Day and I sell flowers. I want to be able to scale out horizontally on demand fast. And so I could scale out as far as I want right now. Um, in this case, let's make it, I don't know, 20, something like that. Actually, yeah, so now you can see the numbers are updated to 20, and if I type it again, it'll probably have started all 20. Nope, only 10 are running. So after a couple of seconds, you'll see, you know, you've got 20 of these pods running. Each one of those pods represents a horizontally scalable portion of your application, an Apache server, Nginx, whatever. So that's how easy 20 are running. So that's how easy horizontal scaling is in Kubernetes. I'm scaling it manually, but there's heuristics in, uh, in Kubernetes that you could have this all happen dynamically for you. And the fact that you can start these things and stop them within a couple of seconds makes it really dynamic. Um, we're gonna get to the point where we can automatically schedule new nodes to come online. So not only new pods to come online when you need resources, but new nodes to automatically get admitted to the cluster as well. And so that you can basically have this cloudy thing that expands and contracts as your workload does. So you never really pay more than you need to for those resources. And so if I go to, I don't know, 100. Watch this blow up. I probably won't. Um, the last bit I wanted to share with you, I guess. Can you guys see this? This is some of the data we have internally um, about node scalability. So you can see how much CPU it used to use when you're creating these pods and uh, all the way down towards the bottom here. Actually, the, the y-axis changed, so it's hard to see, but the point is that it's you know a factor of four, at least four, more efficient than it used to be to run the same amount of, uh, the same amount of workload. So let's see, if, do we have 100 running yet?
46. It's getting there. It'll get to 100, I promise. So I think that's it. It's almost six, right? Yeah. yeah. Questions? I want, I'm sorry if you mentioned this already, but is there any difference between running a privileged and non-privileged container from a performance point of view? <coughs> no. <laughs> Sometimes we have to run privileged in order to get some apps to even work in containers. Uh, we have it's my case, so that's what I'm asking here. <sighs> Yeah, so sometimes an application will expect like a real PID one, and when that happens, we have to run it privileged because we have to run system D in a container. Like we could run supervisor D also, technically. But are you familiar with supervisor D? It's a, it's a PID one replacement sort of thing that Docker, I guess they support it. Um, we don't actually ship or support it. So. I'm interested how OpenShift compares with uh, Amazon's own uh, Elastic uh, Container Service uh, from performance point of view. Do you have any idea? No. Didn't you try to test them? Yeah, we tried a lot of stuff. Well, That's not in the deck. <laughs> um, yeah. I not, I'm not going to give you any competitive. There is even driver for, or provider for Kubernetes uh, uh, those, those Yeah. Um, yeah I'm aware. So, I think that's it, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the slides from today are on there. If you already cloned it, then you have them. Thank you, guys. If you still have any of these, I need these back. Otherwise. are that if you have really heavy workloads, you have to uh, just like with just like with bare metal though. I mean, if you have a really big database, you gotta buy a really
Yeah, maybe you can uh, you can share those uh, research instances with the production yeah. and just use them in case there are no customers. Yes. Our I customer specifically, I specifically set up a separate account for us because we intentionally want time and I don't want to go anywhere. So we're in a totally separate. We're actually in a separate. You should listen to the No, uh, thank you. Very much. Generally, we don't have your range. Oh, this uh, morning. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Good to meet you too. Talk to you later. So, uh, yeah. how are you guys doing? Yeah. Hey, great. We just got uh, auto Shabbat and we went to the internet. We just had a moment. We got a little bit of space. We yeah. got it to the phone number for you. We just yeah, yeah. here on Monday this week. Oh, cool. Good. So he's gonna get, he's gonna get all that stuff fixed finally or figured out. He actually plans to meet with Mr. Russian for a few months. Yeah. So probably you know open my speech. Yeah, they have one guy. Hey. Oh, thank you very much. They have one guy doing it at the Peter Peter U Y U. 